Thank you. I want to thank organizers, but also all of you who are still here. It has been a long, long, tough day. And uh, <clears throat> let me first tell you a little bit about the structure of my talk. Actually, my, my personal favorite is a pineapple talk, where you make a slice. It's kind of nice to slice pineapple, and then you eat it. And then you make a new slice, and you eat it. But this, unfortunately, won't be a pineapple talk. Then there are coconut talks. I know this is Ian's favorite. You need to work really hard. You need to go through many difficult slides and in the end it's a rewarding. But this would be like a <coughs> beach talk. So there will be a soft part. This would be what I usually motivate this for physicists. But uh, this time I also included hard part. I want to show you one, one sketch of a proof that I, I feel is a kind of nice Nice proof, and uh, yeah, that, that's what I'm going to talk today. And I probably won't need full 45 minutes. So since you came here, I want to give you a gift back. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> this will be a talk about quantum observables. And when I say quantum observable, I mean POVM. I know some people call it generalized POVM, but let's just make it short, observable. And it is observing, it is about observing something. So physically it's like a device that eats a quantum state and gives you measurement outcome. And then we call it measurement outcome distribution, right? And how we write it in mathematical terms, we write it as a normalized POVM. And the beginning of the talk we will be fine of using just POVMs with finite number of outcomes, okay? We will, we will need a full, full definition of POVM later. But at, at, at the moment you can th think POVM in this way, like we typically think in quantum information. Okay? And now, <clears throat> let's first uh, like clarify what it means when two observables are jointly measurable. Probably many of you have some idea, but that we kind of agree what it means. Because, I mean, you don't have this kind of devices. Joint measurement, we are thinking about some kind of simultaneous measurement, but somehow it's not really precise. So how I like to think about joint measurement is that, okay, you make measurement, ordinary measurement. So you, it's a POVM and you, you get this uh, series of outcomes, okay? But what you can then do, you can just go to Xerox and you can, you can make copies of your list of measurement outcomes. You can make as many copies as you want, okay? Nothing exciting yet. And then what you can do then? Well, if you want, you can process your outcomes. If you process them in some consistent way. So I call this relabeling. Here are two examples of relabeling if, for instance, your original measurement device has four outcomes. And, and as you see, I mean, you can, for instance, just be, let's say you would be interested if the outcome is even or odd. Okay, then you would do that left-hand side relabeling. Then you would have outcomes telling one or two. Or perhaps you would be interested only, do I get outcome four or something else? Okay, then it would make sense to do that, uh, uh, this relabeling. So we get, uh, by making different relabelings, we get different series of outcomes. And now <coughs> we can forget how we got them. And now, I mean, these are now two different observables. Observable is some, just something that gives you measurement outcomes when you give a quantum state. So it's, it's a very simple, but it's also like a truly operational way. And, and <coughs> so this is definition of compatibility. Joint, measura joint measurability, compatibility. Two observables are compatible if you can find that third device, M and relabeling function so that you can write them in that way. So the question is about existence of something, okay? And then if they are not compatible, then we call them incompatible. And it's the incompatibility, it's the one that uh, makes observables quantum. 
We will come to that soon. Okay. <coughs> there is a alternative definition. If you know something about compatibility, you have probably seen this definition. So <coughs> you can show, and it's not difficult to show, that you can always, if you can find that M and relabeling functions F and G, then you can actually also find that sort of M that gives your A and B as marginals. And um, <coughs> so when, whenever it's convenient to think about compatibility in this way, okay, then we use this way. But I think if you first see this one, then you would ask, okay, but why you, why you insist that you can write them as marginals? Well, we don't have to, but it leads to the same definition, okay? And a <coughs> couple of uh, basic things about compatibility. Probably many of you know this, but uh, let's just warm up a bit. Remember, this is the soft part. Hard part will be <coughs> great. So if A and P commute, then they are compatible. Okay, this uh, is easy. You can just uh, write this M joint observable like this, and why, why this is a valid P of M? Because they commute, this is positive. This positive operator, that's all you need, okay? And then probably also what uh, you have learned is that if A or P is sharp, so projective, or some people call von Neumann measurement, then they are compatible if and only if they commute. So if you live in this projective world, then it's only about commutativity. But I would say this is, this is a boring world. We need something else. Okay, I also tell you a kind of star versions of these. Still relatively simple things, but that little bit generalize these things. If the anti-commutator anti-commutator of AX and PY is positive. So anti-commutator would be positive. Then I can also write this M. Okay, I need to one half to normalize it. If this is positive, then okay, fine. This is a P of M. So positivity of anti commutator also guarantees compatibility. And as you can see, I mean, this is more general condition than commutativity. This can be positive even in other cases. And a, a generalized version of the, of the other thing, this is my, my friend Takeuki Miyadera, who proved this kind of nice inequality that <coughs> if this, this inequality here guarantees incompatibility. And how you can interpret this? Well, if this goes zero, if, if these are projections, this goes zero, and then, then you recover the previous one. But if these are small, so they are almost large, but the left-hand side is large, so then they are also incompatible. Okay, those are kind of basic warm-up things, okay? And now we can kind of go to the direction of the actual, actual topic of my talk today. So this POVM concept, it's uh, general enough that you can, you can also write trivial observables as POVMs. Trivial observable is, is something that if we open box, you have a measurement device, it can be something that it doesn't depend at all on the input state. So as a POVM, P of M, it would simply be these operators, I write now this trivial observable Tx, this would just be some probability distribution and identity operator. So then when you take Born formula, it doesn't depend on the input state. And, uh, <coughs> well, easy, easy fact, but kind of starting point for us is that trivial observable is compatible with any other observable. You can, of course, you can see that from the, this uh, 
commutativity condition, but you can also just think about, I mean, what's the physical reason for that? Well, if I produce outcome x with this blue device, I don't need input state to produce outcome y. Okay, so with single input, I can produce both x and y. So they are compatible. And uh, <coughs> now, this is, this is still easy observation, but this kind of generalizes, generalizes what, what, uh, what, uh, what I said previously, that if I now have two observables, a and b, and I take mixture of a with trivial and mixture of b with trivial that we could consider as noisy versions of a and b, then they are always compatible. You can choose your trivial observables however you want, just if they are trivial, then this is, in this way you can produce compatible observables, no matter where you start, even like non commutative uh, one normal measurements. <coughs> and slightly more general, we can always add more noise. So if I take smaller t, in the previous slide my t is half, if I take smaller t, then interpretation would be that these are noisier observables, even noisier observables. And you can show that, okay, then compatibility can only only increased, you can, you, they must be compatible. Proof of this statement is uh, again very simple, we can just draw pictures. So how you would now write joint observable? We want to, remember we want to produce not A and B but mixtures of these noisy versions, A mixed with uh, T1, B mixed with T2. Well. We get input state, we toss a coin, should we measure A blue box or B red box? Let's say that uh, uh, we measure blue box, then we, we cannot anymore measure red box because we are using the input state for blue box. But of course we can, uh, we can produce this uh, trivial outcome. And if, if you now calculate what you get, it, you, you get exactly those noisy versions. And uh, <coughs> now we are soon coming to the question, still patient a little bit. So now what we want to ask, we ask that I give you A and B, two incompatible observables, and I want to know what is the largest T that uh, <coughs> makes them compatible. So now you see that uh, why we are asking this, if this t is larger than one half, then I don't have this stupid box picture. Then the joint measurement be something that is, is in some sense I have to open box and really do something quantum. Then I don't, I don't have that uh, mixing strategy anymore. And uh, so we, we started to talk about this some years ago and, and uh, this is now called uh, compatibility decree of two observables. So it's simply the largest T that makes uh, these noisy versions compatible. And in this, uh, this notation, our earlier argument that the pictorial proof simply means that this compatibility decree is always half or greater. Half is the minimal. For compatible pair, it's of course one, okay? And uh, let me also uh, tell you about one, one uh, observation that you could think in this one half number, it doesn't matter which trivial observables you take. But we have, we have a find out that for other values of t, it matters. So in this, when you are just at the compatibility domain, and you are making kind of optimal joint measurement, it matters which uh, trivial observables you choose. So you need to kind of search over, optimize over all trivial observables. Okay, so you can calculate this for two observables. One uh, good example is uh, 
two mutually unbiased bases. So just fix one orthonormal one basis, then you take the then you take the finite Fourier transform, and then you have two bases that satisfy this mutually unbiasedness condition. So the inner product is always always a fixed number, and if it's fixed, it actually has to be this number. And well, I'm, I'm not going to uh, now give you proof of this fact. I, I just want to say that you, you get the number and you could have thought that, okay, if, uh, if something are very incompatible, they must be mutually unbiased bases. But uh, as you see, I mean, this number is always strictly greater than one half. As a limit, you go to one half. And uh, <coughs> Then when we are talking about compatibility, you may already kind of notice that isn't this somehow similar to approximate cloning? And actually approximate cloning leads you to think that perhaps there is some way to always make approximate, good approximate joint measurement. Think that I have approximate cloning device. So something that gives me from unknown state to approximate copies of that state. And then what I do, I simply measure my chosen observables A and B on those approximate clones. Okay, this is not going to be joint measurement of A and B, but this can be joint measurement of the, these noisy versions, right? Depending on my cloning device. And it happens that this uh, Kyle Werner cloning device that is known to be optimal if you require this symmetric universality and those kind of properties, it gives you exactly right kind of uh, noisy versions. It gives you that sort of noise. And when you calculate the, uh, these marginal observables, you see that any pair, whatever observables I put there, they are compatible. The, no the noisy versions are compatible when t is smaller than that sort of number. And uh, so now we have this kind of picture. Here, this now summarizes this discussion so far. So D is here dimension and C is compatibility degree and I have plotted here those uh, numbers compatibility degree for mutually unbiased basis in finite dimensions. And this approximate cloning argument gives you now lower bound for any observables, any pair of observables. And I don't know what, what happens here. So compatibility degree must be above this blue line. Here we can find observables like mutual bound spaces. This area I don't know. But today I will, I'm going to now tell you about infinite dimensions. So I'm happy to discuss with someone about this. If perhaps you, some of you know something, I'm happy to know more, but this is not topic today. I mentioned here <coughs> one more example that if we limit to two outcome observables, observables with two outcomes, so in this case, also, the trivial observables has only two outcomes. These are compatible whenever this noise parameter is smaller or equal one over square root two, and this is the this is the best bound. And and well, this was observed in, in, in those papers, but actually proof proof relies on a result of of uh, Wolf, Perez, Garcia and Fernandez when they, they prove that if you have incompatible pair of dichotomic observables, so two outcome observables, any such pair violates CHSH inequality. And then we just apply Geraldson bound. The, why we, and now, now you can recognize that, okay, then it makes sense that we get this number. Somehow when you, when you plug in these noisy observables to CHS8, you see that it would scale with this noise T. So if you would have observables with higher compatibility degree, you would also 
violate CSA it's more, which is not possible. So that's how you get that. Of course, this requires a paper and pen, but this is this is the <coughs> idea in that proof. Okay, so now we come to the title of my talk, Maximally Incompatible Observables. So the question is then, this one half is absolute bound for compatibility degree. Do we have that sort of observable pairs? They would certainly be kind of interesting creatures if we have them. I repeat again what we have seen now, they cannot exist in finite dimension. Not with any number of outcomes, because this cloning, approximate cloning argument doesn't see number of outcomes. It always gives you this bound. But uh, let us first, for a moment, forget about quantum. So if we look observables in other state spaces, it's actually quite easy to find maximally incompatible observables. Okay, I, I explain you what this means. So, <coughs> square state space is the most common example that you typically use when you want to test something in generalized probabilistic theories. If you've never heard about GPTs, that's fine. I mean, you can easily follow, follow this calculation. The idea is simply that your states are now points in this square. You have four pure states, others are mixed states, and now observables are Again, just something that give you probably the outcome distributions. They have to, of course, respect the mixtures. And I write almost, almost simplest observables. So A observable would give one for C and D. Sorry, sorry, plus outcome with probably one for state C and D minus with probably one for A and B, and now B observable would do the same thing, but now giving outcome plus with probably one for D and B. And then it's not difficult to see that then you get maximal incompatibility. This, if you have heard about popescu rory boxes, PR boxes, this certainly now you, you see that, okay, if you have two of these sort of state spaces and you have maximal tensor product, then you have PR box. And so then it makes sense this zeros upon argument now is completely consistent with this maximal incompatibility. Any case, if you haven't heard about those kind of things, that's okay. I mean, this was just to show that these kind of things exist, at least in other theories. Now, this was recently completely answered maximal incompatibility of two outcome measurements by Anna Jenchoma and Martin Plavala. And I don't uh, tell you the, the full result, I just, I just show you a couple of things. So as a corollary of the full characterization, they for instance can say that this square is a special thing in plane. So plane, if you have maximal maximally incompatible two outcome measurements, it need, need to be parallelogram. Okay, then in other dimensions it can be something different that they fully characterized. But interestingly, they are, they are also saying in this paper and, and proving this that if you look maximally incompatible measurements on quantum channels, then they exist. What does this mean? What does this mean? Well, in, when you are saying measurement for quantum channels, you mean that you look choice states and then your measurements are now measurements that you can implement on channels. So <coughs> you have a channel and choice state you get by plugging in maximally entangled state and now you do measurement here. But when we think about choice states we consider whole this part as a measurement. Some people call this PPOVM, process POVM. 
It, and it, this makes complete sense. I mean, you just think about channels as your states. Channels are the objects that you're studying. Okay, so in any case, maximally incompatible two outcome measurement exists. But we, we wanted to see if quantum, standard quantum observables can be maximally incompatible. And now what I have told you, I repeat, cannot exist in finite dimension, cannot be dichotomic. And the answer is simply yes, the standard position and momentum observables are maximally incompatible. And uh, <coughs> I want to now tell you main parts of the proof, not going to the actual calculations, but this actually kind of, uh, uh, <coughs> there are some nice elements in the proof. So we want to prove that compatibility degree of Q and P is one half, meaning that they are as incompatible as any, any pair can be, okay? And the ingredients of, of this proof, there are a couple of, couple of uh, easy properties, so complementarity of QMP, I will, I will soon remind us what this, what this means, this you are using, and covariance on phase-based translations. These are kind of things that you need. And the technique, how this happens, is what I call symmetrization of POVMs. And the tool here is invariant mean. Okay, so now I walk you through this. So position, when I, when I say position observable, I want to think it as a operate, operator valued measure. So it's a set function and, uh, and for any Borel subset, it gives you positive operator and define it that way, okay? And momentum then same formula, but now you have a Fourier transform. So we are, we are really thinking them as operator valued measures. These are just the usual of course, often, often in physics books, we just take the first moment operator, but now we think them as measures. And uh, <coughs> complementarity that you can find in, in many textbooks, for instance, this one, operational quantum physics, you can phrase it in this way. If I can localize particle, meaning there is bounded interval x, probably of finding it there is one, then I cannot localize, mom I, I, I cannot say anything definite on momentum, so for any bounded interval, probability cannot be neither zero or one, and vice versa. So this is um, complementarity. And it, uh, convenient, convenient way to write it is, is to say that if I have positive operator that is below Qx and Py for, for bounded intervals, then this operator must be one. What about then uh, covariance? Covariance is actually something that, for instance, in this book is taken to be definition of positional momentum, and not only in quantum, but also in classical physics. So covariance, if I, if I measure like the where is classical particle football, I measure, I get something, let's say five meters, but then I go one meter back, I measure again, I get six meters. So when I move my own place, my measurement results are changing accordingly. And, the, and this is the covariance. So in, in phase space, we describe uh, phase space translations with while operators, and then covariance is simply written in that way. Okay, so complementarity covariance. And now what about the symmetrization? Let me first uh, wake you up with a naive example, very, very, very stupid naive example. I just want to kind of <coughs> explain the root of this. We have a function. It's not even. We want to make it even function. We will, this is our symmetry. What I do? Well, I, I mirror it and then I sum them together. And now I have even function. I have symmetrized it. Of course, I, th this is now different function, but there is something still present of F here, right? And we do something similar now for POVMs. For POVMs, think about first finite group. 
unitary representation and then P of M defined on this G. So measurement outcomes is, are also elements of this finite group G. What I do then, this is just similar thing as with that function. So I translate and shift it and in that, that case this, this, this new P of M here is covariant. I start from P of M that is not necessarily covariant. I make this symmetrization, I get covariant P of M. And this is actually, as, as you see, you can, you can think summation just as a hard measure and you can do the same thing in, in, in a compact group. Now the problem is that phase space is locally compact. We have hard integral but it's not anymore normalized. And this is now where von Neumann comes to help us. So <coughs> definition of an invariant mean is that it's functional on a set of bounded complex functions, positive for positive functions, and translates an invariant. So f g simply means translated function. And why this is uh, why why this is different to integration because this is defined for all bounded complex functions. It can it can be zero for compactly supported. I mean this is you, you don't get <coughs> measure in this way. Anyway, it exists for Abelian groups. Probably there are mathematicians who would tell I I simply know that it doesn't exist for all groups. Probably some of you could tell that to which groups it exactly exists. I don't know more about that, but our phase space R2 is luckily Abelian group, so we have that kind of object. And now this was in a uh, paper of Reinhard Werner in 2004, and he wrote what this symmetrization means for, for phase space observables, so observables defined on R2. So we have a P of M defined on R2 and what I first do, first step, now I have two steps, this doesn't work otherwise. For any, okay now we can talk about bounded continuous functions, I define a new function on phase space. This, this is here when I use a square bracket, this is integral and then I shift it. So I, as you see, you, you see that this is analogous to what we did with finite group. But now <coughs> our average map is now the value what invariant mean does for this one. So we cannot integrate this but we take this invariant mean on that. And this is, this is good, this is now normalized. One is here just a constant function one. Okay, this little bit uh, like uh, formal is a little bit ugly but that's why I wanted to motivate you with that finite group example. So this is the same thing. And now, when I restrict this symmetrized average, average map to functions, continuous functions with compact support, I get a P of M. But the, but the crucial point is now that this P of M need not be normalized. It can be normalized, it don't have to be normalized. So it depends where you start it. In any case, I can <coughs> always say that for any bounded continuous functions I have this inequality. So this is the average one and this is now the in some sense measure part of that map. And yes it is not normalized. Now we are kind of ready. One this is just a uh, way to talk about things. Weight at infinity simply now means that we look, if it would come from completely from measure, then this would be identity, okay? But now we look how big you can get from this continuous function with compact support and we take the identity minus that one and this is called weight at infinity. Just so, it's just a notation but it will be useful. And this is uh, my last couple of slides are now sketch of how we use this now to prove this thing. So now we remember the definition of compatibility degree. We take it here. So we take T 
I don't, I don't know what is this CQP, what is complete degree, but I take something T that is below. So in that case, I must have joint observable by definition. P1 and P2 are just probably distributions. And now I do this, apply this machinery to that observable. I get this average P of M and then I get M0. And from covariance, first of all, follows that this Q part and P part, they don't change in that symmetrization because they are already symmetric. It's the same like with even, this even function thing. You make that symmetrization, if it's even function, it doesn't change. The same is true here in this covariation. So that part doesn't change and then this M0, when you look X times Y, it must be then common lower bound for these operators. And now from complementarity, you get that this must be then zero. Because complementarity meant that if you have some operator, positive operator below QXPY with compact sets, then this must be zero. Now R2 is sigma compact, so being zero on those sets means that this must be zero, meaning that this symmetrized map has only weight at infinity. It only lives at infinity. Okay, and then, okay, these calculations, I, I don't can go into this, but you can, again, with uh, using covariance, you can show that the margins of this map, you can calculate weights at infinity for them, and then generally, generally we always have upper bound for weight at infinity for this map, if I know the weights for the margins. So this then gives me simple inequality that forces T to be less or equal to one half. So that's the <coughs> story about that proof. Do I still have how many minutes I have done? Um, five. Okay, good. So I can make some final remarks. So <coughs> We know a couple of other examples of maximally incompatible observables, but I have no idea what is the characterization, like what is the, what are the crucial properties? This is like phase-based covariance, this is specific for QAP. You use in the proof, but, but there are also others that don't have that one. So what, uh, <coughs> what, what where did it boils down to? And then an interesting question to me is that do you always need to have infinite number of outcomes? You need to go to infinite dimension, but could you have P of N with finite number of outcomes in infinite dimensions that would be maximally incompatible? Do you have both infinities or just one? And, well, you can also criticize perhaps this approach that, well, this mixing with trivial observable, this is only one type of noise. You can think of other type of noises also. So perhaps uh, Q and P are maximally incompatible only because they are sensitive to that sort of noise. And I can only tell that this, the, this is something that one can calculate, what, can, what one can compare in different theories, what is somehow reasonable to compare observables in different dimensions. It's kind of robust in that sense, but I would be Yes, also interested to look something other quantifications. And now let me just finally say that many of you probably know more about entanglement than separable states. And there are things like entanglement breaking channels, genuine multiparted entanglement, interesting things. But now in this uh, <coughs> compatible and incompatible sets, there are similar things. What people have done are, are analogous things, incompatibility, breaking channels, genuine envice incompatibility and that sort of things. So what I'm uh, proposing you, if you know something nice on separable entanglement, try to think if you can do it here. So maximal incompatibility is kind of analog of 
maximally entangled states. Compatible uh, pairs are, uh, it's again convex set and it has several similar properties. But there is uh, many things to be explore, explored. Thank you.